All right, welcome back, everyone. And in the previous video, we did deferred lighting. So we um, created a way to process all our data into the G-buffer and then using one shader to actually calculate every single um, pixel uh, its light. Uh, this way, we can kind of speed up the process so you don't have to do forward rendering um, and calculate the light on every single object, which kind of complicates lighting. And um, there's a lot of pixels that will get um, overlapped that you end up wasting all that calculating. You can do a couple of other fun things once you do post-processing and everything else. So we're going to continue that. So once we have deferred lighting, now we're going to do shadow maps. And we're going to do shadow maps, which is tacked on to our deferred lighting. Um, so here is shadows. They're not perfect, because I'm not doing any anti-aliasing. Um, but this is what you would expect from shadow maps. and when you deal with shadows, there's several different ways you can kind of go about it based on lighting. Uh, you have point lights, uh, directional lights, and um, point lights, directional, and spotlights. Um, and each one does sh has, does shadows completely differently. A point light um, throws a shadow in all different directions, so that means you kind of need to do um, a 3D or a a cube map. So you have to create a cube map of the actual shadows, which is kind of it should is kind of more of a complicated thing. And I think it uses a projection matrix. Uh, a spotlight again uses the light source as a camera and then uses a projection matrix. And then you have directional light, which we're using today, which is um, less information online, so it's harder to, to to learn how to do it correctly. Um, which is the light exists everywhere. It's basically the sunlight, which is very important to, to know how to do this. Um, but it's directional light and it's it's basically to mimic sunlight where there's light everywhere pointing in one different one different specific direction. And to do that properly you have to use an orthographic projection. And calculating that orthographic projection is kind of evolved. Evolved. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit you have to do. And mind you, the, the algorithm I'm using is the simple one. Uh, there's our actually um, other forms of algorithms or like t ideas on how to apply shadows I think there's something called cascading shadows which is a better version of what I'm using simply because it's more complicated it's more work um, so I wanted to do something more simpler even though even though all shadows are actually kind of complicated uh, but this is kind of this more simpler version of world sunlight so uh, at some point, maybe I'll do a video on cascading shadow, which creates a better uh, shadows, less pixelated, I believe, and more optimized. But for now, we're going to do this with directional lighting. So this is our scene and everything else. Um, I guess I can quickly whiteboard some ideas. So I'm pretty sure everyone understands how a shadow works. You know, shadows in real life, how to mimic it and everything else. So, you know, the, the usual, like in any tutorial you go, you'll see things like this. You have a sunlight, and it will cast the shadow, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 kitty, yeah, kitty. Okay? <laughs> uh, if, you've been, if you've been trying to study this subject, you get this usual um, thing. So, and that's what a directional light. It's in, um, ideally, directional light has no point but you can determine the direction based on point. So like if the sun exists in this part of the sky, from from that point to let's say origin, let's say the origin's over here, that becomes your that's your direction. So, so uh, some videos say direction light has no point of reference. It kind of does because you can use the point of reference as a determining factor of direction. Um, now the point of the, the, the light, your directional light point is not the same point that you would be using for your camera. And I'm probably jumping the gun here. Um, the idea, is, the way shadow maps works is that our light source technically becomes a camera. And if we were to use, um, and a camera has either projection matrix or orthographic matrix. Uh, no, sorry. It is. It has a projection matrix. It can either be perspective or orthographic. So, 
if you're using like a spotlight, um, you can use a projection matrix. It creates, you know, this kind of thing. It kind of warps everything. You know, so the shadows goes this way. Everything gets warped out, essentially. Uh, it skews everything. Um, if we're going to use orthographic projection, um, everything becomes more evened out. So, like I say, this is the camera. That means it didn't. Everything goes in this direction. So everything, so it creates the shadows exactly kind of where you want it. So that's why we have to use an orthographic projection to create sunlight because sunlight is everywhere. So we want everything to be nice and even, and and the and the light is this way. Because if we're going to use, like I said, uh, so if, if if we use an orthographic projection, all light travels this way, right? And that's what we well, that's that's how the sun works. But like I said before, if we're going to use a projection matrix, which is a spotlight. That means light isn't sh isn't in the same direction. Light happens in all these skewed directions, and that's a spotlight. But again, that's not how the sun works. So we have to figure out an author uh, author orthographic projection. And now the the other biggest issue is that we need two cameras. We got we need we need one camera that is a projection matrix, right? That renders our scene. But then we need a light camera that hopefully renders our scene that fills in what the main camera fill that the, um, or at least some or, or most or part of what's in our main camera fuckstrom. So this is basically the idea of how it works. We have two cameras that at work the main camera that renders the scene and then we have the light camera that renders only the shadows and to and when we render this we create a frame buffer and absolutely no color we absolutely don't need to set up any color buffers everything's purely buffer uh, buffer, uh purely depth um, if you were using uh, webgl 1.0 you would have to use a color buffer uh, because you can't because uh, in WebGL 1, you can't use depth buffers as a texture. But in WebGL 2.0, you can. Um, in 1.1, you can if you have access to a specific extension. But like I said, with WebGL 2.0, since the series is mostly focused on, we can tr use depth buffers as textures when we create a, cr a frame buffer. Uh, and the last thing... I probably need to really mention is that when we calculate the shadows, how do we determine the shadows? Is that we need to know the world space of everything. So if we're rendering, let's say, this scene right here, this point, let's just say this author projection uh, goes here this far. Uh, I probably made a huge mess out of everything. Here you go. So let's say I'm rendering this point, right? So this is the world space point. Um, so when we are rendering this scene, we know the world space point here. And we usually uh, multiply this by the projection matrix, so this way it gets skewed and it looks like how we're supposed to. To So when we're rendering the scene, we need to take this world position of that pixel that we're rendering. We have to determine, is this in the shadow or is it not in the shadow? And what we need to do is take this and then multiply it by this camera's um, proje uh, projection matrix, right? So, so this is world space. We usually multiply by the main camera's projection matrix, but to render it, to color it and everything else, but we also need to also put it into the light cameras. So, we, so, you, so for every pixel, that we're drawing, we have to render it in two different cameras. We're two, it's basically a two-camera rendering. Um, and we need to handle both projection matrices. So by doing that, so once we multiply that by the projection matrix and then um, do some other things to it, we move it into, like uh, I think, N 
NDP. Normalized device, uh, NDC, I think. Normalized device coordinates. Essentially, we're projecting it by that camera, and then we are creating basically the, the coordinates for the UV coordinates, basically. We end up calculating the UV coordinates that we can then use to um, access the texture to figure out if this point has the same depth in both cameras. If both cameras have the same about the same depth value, that means it's not in shadow. If this point, the depth value is here, that means, you know, okay, the depth here is, you know, maybe seven... And over here, the death value here is like three. You know, there's a problem there. They're not, they're not they're not similar, not identical. They're not about the same depth um, as each other. So if for some reason that death value is less or, or is less on this camera, that means you're in the shadow. So that's uh, hopefully you understand what I'm talking about. It maybe it'll make sense you see in code. Maybe you won't. But like I said, you kind of need to basically bounce this out. And don't forget, this camera has a texture. Um, uh, I had a really great idea for uh, how to draw it. I don't know. Let's see if maybe this will be a much better interpretation. Um, let's see if I can draw this. So, uh, so damn, uh, I'm trying to remember, I had a really cool idea about how to render this. So, I, mm, probably not the, oops, I can't draw a 3D cube to save my life. So, let's say this is our viewing air world, right? This is not exactly how it is, but this is how you're going to determine it. So, we have our camera, right? Let's say we have our, our, our main camera here, right? And, and this one is our light camera. So, I'll just make it, you know, whatever. <coughs> when you're rendering th from the main camera, we have a texture because we're doing deferred rendering. So let's say this square is our texture. And for this one, camera, this side is our texture, essentially. This is how we view the world, and this is how we see the world. Down here is the point. So this point exists in world space, right? And when we're drawing, let's say we're going to draw, let's say this point in this square, right, which actually points to that in world space. So this is like camera space, essentially. This is um, the texture that we're rendering to. This is this is where it looks like on the 2D plane, and this is where it really exists in 2D in 3D space. So we this each each texture either one either uh, either one of these textures require it uses a projection matrix to get there to get from this point to here, you need the projection mixture of that camera. To get to this texture that lives over here, you need a different projection matrix, which is the orthographic camera. So when we're rendering this pixel, which really points to this world space, we need to go back to this world space, calculate that projection that points us to this place. And, and mind you, th it's, since it's orthographic projection, it's not like this one where it kind of just points to it. It's kind of like this. Because like I said, everything's nice and even. Everything pr points to the same spot. So, we're, so when we are in our shader, we grab that world space and we translate it by using that projection. So this way we can get the UV coordinates Essentially, because because uh, it's NDC, I believe. Because uh, remember, um, the the way the projection matrices works, you have uh, your model view, view matrix. 
then you have your view matrix actually it's model view matrix view matrix so this is the model this is basically um, taking things from local space local to world um, view matrix I believe takes you from world space to, to view space and then you have your projection matrix which takes you I can't remember it's it NDC I totally forget it's been a while NDC or clip space Um, or maybe they're both the same thing. Um, I think it goes to NDC or cl it, it, it. I believe when this thing convert, it converts your coordinates into a value between negative one and one. All right. So all you have to do is once you have that coordinate space value, you just translate. You just remap negative one to one to zero to one and then you can use that as a UV coordinate in your um, uh, death texture so basically you kind of have to you know, that's that's the idea the math behind a lot of it so yeah <laughs> and that is pretty much the gist of how uh, shadow mapping works and now let's look at code because that probably makes more sense um, but I'm going to do a lot of visualization. So here, here's our scene, nicely lit. We have a nice light shadow. I put like a camera idea. Yeah, I think that in the last video, I put like a, um, a quad on the floor so we can actually see the lighting. So instead of using our grid, I don't want that. All right. So there's a lot of bit of, there's a lot of code we have to go through. So I'm going to try to go a little bit at a time. Um, so this is, this is a continuation from the previous video which had deferred shade, uh, sh deferred light rendering. So now we're just going to just kind of add on to it. So we have something we're going to have something called light direction, and the light direction object is very simple. Um, in the beginning, it like I said, it only is going to hold pretty much a position, and when you set the position, it should un automatically calculate its direction. Um, so to get an idea of what it looks like, we can visualize everything. Oops, and I want to go here. Refresh. And there you are. And there's our light source. There's the point, and then by calculating the point from origin, we have our direction. So that's our light direction. So ideally, that's the sun. So ideally, uh, technically, th that position is irrelevant. It could be here, it could be here, it could be to infinity, as long as it, we could determine the, uh, some direction. That's the whole. That's the whole point. And that point exists if you want to, like let's say, I want to move this light source as, as as the sun is moving. That point like ex exists only to recalculate um, the, the direction of the light. Um, this is not the point of where. The ca light camera goes, so don't confuse the two points. That's why the point of the light direction does not e equivalent to the light, to the position of the light camera. Oh my God, I keep going back to here. Um, there we go. So light direction by default, uh, if I go down to here, here's the light direction class. Uh, has a default value already. So that's the direction. I put, I save it to the position. I normalize the position. I save the direction. I save that normalized value to to the direction, and then I invert it because the it's, that's the direction. Yes, that's the direction because it's inverted. It's because by default the direction is from origin to that light but the light direction is actually from that point down but normalized so that's why it's inverted and I normalize it and if I set the position it kind of just recalculates the, the direction so let's go all the way back to the top so that's how we set up our light 
And um, and I think in the last video I said that I'm using a UBO to save light information. So instead of pushing it into the shader, I push it to a global UBO. So that means any shader can then quickly access it. So I don't have to constantly, I don't have to write sh shader code that constantly, like I don't have to build, I don't have to add uniforms to all my lighting code. It, it just exists. I just have to grab the UBO, which makes it a lot easier. Um, in future videos, I'm going to actually use a, a Nuxture UBO to actually handle uh, other things. So this way, less things we're dealing with um, in our, for every single shader. Um, <clears throat> so, like I said, we need a camera. So we have a light camera, which is going to be just our camera orthographic. So uh, I think this is kind of new. I, s I split out the camera into two different cameras, one for orthographic, one for perspective. We have a shadow mapping cl uh, object, which all it does is handle rendering to our texture. And all and the other thing that shadow map does is create our frame buffer. So if I go to shadow map, uh, sh our shadow map class, uh, as you can see, when you create it, it creates a shader, which is up here. This is this is all you need to render our um, our shadows. So no, not render our shadow. This is all we need to generate our shadow buffer. So this is this is this, so that's it. It's very simple. It's all we need is the light projection matrix, the model matrix, and that's it. And we don't like I said, we don't use anything else, and we. We need a, sh a fragment shader to compile it, but we actually disable the fragment shader. So this way, we only uh, do I do we, do I? I thought we did. Create. Huh. I, I, I'm I haven't I haven't touched this in a month, so I'm a little confused. I thought that you can disable the frame. Oh, you know, I can, never mind. I can disable the frame buffer, uh, the fragment buffer, but that's for something completely different. It has nothing to do with shadows. Sorry, that's for some. That's for particles. I'm sorry, I'm confusing shadows with particles. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so no, no. In this one, we're not disabling the fragment shader. We let the sh uh, the fragment shader run, but we're not saving a color because we don't. We're not. We're only creating a frame buffer with it that has a text uh, death buffer only, no color. Um, I think the only there is there is an do I there is one thing you do have to do though that's probably why I'm a little confused it's in the FBO um, so yeah I'm not disabling it uh, but like if you have there's one thing you have to realize like I said this is important if you're current, if you're gonna create a, a frame buffer that has no color buffer whatsoever. You need to mark it when, when on finalize. So you have text buffer, like uh, we've done this many times in the past, but the finalize function got updated. Um, so if, if, if there is no color buffer at, at all, like if you have a color buffer, you kind of have to set it up. You have to say, okay, here's all the draw buffers that we can use, and it's just an index value uh, in an array. If you actually have no uh, color buffers whatsoever, you set uh, drop buffers to none, which has to be an array. I don't know why, but that's just how WebGL works. So you can still have to pass in an array anyway with the null, uh, none value from GL. It's a constant. And we have to set up the read buffers as none as well. Uh, so this way, we s it's it works better that way. So that, the re that's what you really need to do. So if you're making a frame buffer that only has a death buffer, you need to set these two values. So good thing I remember that, um, and that's it, and you're and you're done with your frame buffer, and the only like I said the only thing the shadow map does is render objects to the death buffer, and it's done as a separate process. So you actually render the entire scene as shadows, then you render your scene after the fact. So you render the entire scene twice. So keep that in mind. You're gonna that that's that's more processing, and. In the future videos, we need to start handling um, things. We need to add uh, bounding boxes to everything, so this way we can do um, frustrum 
frustrum calling. So this way we're only rendering what the camera sees and not everything in the scene. So that because like I said, now that you're rendering the scene twice, you only want to render what you can see twice. And on top of that, there might be objects that um, don't don't collect shadow either. That don't uh, that don't generate shadow like um, like uh, terrains. Terrains shouldn't shouldn't um, create shadows you create shadows on terrains but they shouldn't create shadows themselves so you to, to more optimize it you have to set up every object on the scene as does it create a shadow so we're not doing any of that but there's a lot of optimization to kind of speed it up because you are going to be rendering a lot of things twice if depending on your scene is so just kind of keep in mind this is kind of a bare bones example but it's not the most optimized way of doing this so yes we render the entire scene um since our frame buffer is a square instead of like the screen and you can change it and it, it, it can improve the quality uh, but you should you shouldn't create it too big because you end up making it slower and using up more memory and things like that so this is pretty much good size but if you need a better quality like more anti-aliasing uh, you can just double the size uh, what is the double size is this two four think eight so if I double the size of that texture um, if I refresh this this should the shadow should probably be better mm, only a little bit better not really that much um, yeah only only a smidgen better so uh, your mileage your mileage may vary <laughs> um, all right, so since our texture is a square, that's why it's size and there's no width, no height, it's just a square, we have to set the viewport. So before we render everything, we need to set the viewport to that size. Um, we set the our frame buffer that we're rendering to, and then we clear the depth. So this way we can, we, you know, we can redraw it for that scene. Um, then you have your usual stuff, you know, we load up our shader, um, we push our projection matrix to it. Uh, we pass it like I did. I disable. I turn. I make sure death testing is turned on, and I turned off blending because we don't need blending for um for death. We're not really doing any coloring, and then we just render our shader. Uh, very simple. You know, you just calculate its matrix, and you pass the matrix to the shader, and then you draw it. And then um, set viewport zero zero. Like I have a blank uh, that up here. I like I said. I, I set the, the the viewport. So we have to resize the viewport for rendering. Like basically the rectangle shape or the square shape of our camera. And um, by calling it this way, without it actually resets it back to the default values, which is the our, the size of our our scene. Like or the the view the actual viewport the actual browser size, and set frame buffer also resets it back to the frame uh, main frame buffer, so that's how I have the, those functions set up. I know it's not very intuitive, but if I pass in no values into either of these functions, basically it just resets everything back to its default set setting. So instead of me putting the default values, it's just easier for it just to figure it out on its own. And here's the create shadow shadow function. And that's the shadow map object. Like I said, this is just handles the frame buffer and how it renders. So this is how we render a frame uh, shadow uh, texture. All right. And then we have our deferred lighting, and then we just pass in a new function. I think it's just shadow maps, um, which all it does is just s applies the shadow texture to um, our, our uh, deferred rendering. That's all it does. So I don't need to show it to you. Uh, I, maybe I should, just for completion's sake. Um, what is this? This is a deferred rendering. Add shadow maps. Like I said, just it just um, adds the texture to the to the shader, so it acts so the shader can access the shadow texture that we're generating. And I pass in the light projection matrix for 
um, the shadow. Because remember, I said we need to translate the world space into uh, NDC, so this way we can use that value as a UV value to actually access the death texture, uh, the, yeah, the the shadow texture, which is a depth texture, really. Um, so that's that. So that's just a new function I added to deferred shading. Here are some more objects. The scene. And we have our function with direction, light, shadows. And we have a render loop. So let's start visualizing. First step, because now we need to figure out, since, since we know how to render everything, we need to set up our light camera. So we need to set up its position, its direction, and its uh, projection matrix, which is an orthographic projection. So we need to calculate what the orthographic projection is. So the first step is we need to know our camera, and we need to calculate the frustrum. So if I click that and go back to here, it doesn't look like anything. But if I zoom out, now we can see what the main camera is. So at so when the when when this scene started. It made a snapshot of where the camera was. So this is what the camera was when I first started, when uh, this, when I refreshed. Um, that's the near, and that is actually not the real far, but a predefined far. <coughs> so if you see I have a constant of 10. That means two, 10 units away. Now, if I were to use, let's say, the default value, which is um, actually 100 units away, You, 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 like we can't even see the far plane of our fuckstrom. Really, it's too far away. And the thing is, if you try to render from that much distance away, our, as you can see, our shadow is gone. It's too much. The, that means the texture is. Ixen, 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 ah, I am I'm suck at English. Um, it's not the best. So um, so that's why we have a value. So ideally you are going to render a shadow at a smaller di viewing distance than what the camera can see. See, now you have the shadow. Now it's back. So this is really how far I have the camera. So this is this is the whole area that I'm, I want to kind of render shadows in. And that's why I said there's other when there's this cascading shadows that does a better job of this. So this way you can do a f you can go further and still keep good quality, uh, but like this is this is this is what the shadows exist. This is where I'm making shadows. Um, I can say twenty. Let me see. Just double the viewing distance of our shadows, and as you can see, things get more pi pixelated. So our viewing space got bigger, but our textures. Or our shadow got worse, so that's like why I say it's not the. This is not the best way. This is great for making a scene, but it's probably not the best for gaming. Um, uh, you can have you. Have, you don't have to really work for it to get a pretty decent shadows. Um, essentially, I, I spent two weeks on this. This this drove me mad. Um, but like I said, this is the best I can do because it's just not the best way. But it's the easiest way to learn how to do shadows with directional light. <laughs> it's not the best results, but it's the easiest way to learn. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. Um, so there you go. There's, there's our viewing space. This is the viewing space that we have that we want to render our shadow. So anything technically in, in this space is going to cast a shadow. Uh, the next step is we need to calculate the, the center point of our Fuchstrom. So there's the point. That is the center point, the centroid of the entire frustrum. Uh, um, that point is important because we want to, when the when the camera moves, right? So when the when the camera starts moving, we want to pin the light camera to that position. So we're always looking at the center of our viewing space. So like this thing, the, uh, this light source and direction will be actually added on to that center point at, a at the same range 
as our frustrum. So let's see. So now we know the center point. Uh, it's, it's all up here. This is what very simple stuff. You just add everything up and then you average it. Now we want to, like, let's say, m move the camera. Like We want to know the position where the camera is going to be. So uh, we're going to use the distance from the centroid. Um, I, I, s I did this separately because sometimes you can do an offset to, to improve shadows or not, or to add shadows that exist behind the camera that might cast shadows. So like I said, this, this distance from centroid is something you can play with um, to kind of improve. But for right now, I'm just going to use the far. And I'm, like I said, I'm only going to do is just calculate the new position. And if you want to see what the position looks like to make life easier, there you go. And that's where the camera is going to go. So that's the centroid. And we're going to move it 10 units away, which is the same distance, amount of distance from the camera to the end of our view viewing space for the camera. But we're going at the exact same direction as, as our light. So as you can see, those, those lines are our light direction and our camera to the centroid is parallel. Because like I said, the light direction is always going to stay the same. Now, no matter where you go, that light direction should always stay the same. So we just end up using that centroid, um, adding the dis uh, that direction at the range of far. If that if you understand that, and if you don't understand what I just said, it's this <laughs> centroid minus direction at the scale of the distance from the centroid, which is far. There you go. Now that we we know the position and I and, and the direction of our light camera, we want to transform our frustrum, our world space frustrum. Because right now these these are the points in world space that our, our frustrum exists. This is this is the viewing area of our camera. We want to translate that viewing area into our light camera world space so, or it's its own space so we end up transforming it by using um, the matrix oh and I, I forgot to mention here this part important part once we have our position and everything we, we need to calculate uh, the view matrix for it um, mat, mat, matrix for look at function is not what you think it is. It doesn't create, it's not like the Quintorian um, look at function that I had where you point, it just creates a rotation that points in that specific direction that you're looking at. The look at function of a MAT4 does not do that. It kind of does that, but it, 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 it essentially it does an invert of it because this does not generate a rotation matrix. Uh, a look at a looking rotate. Like, let me like, say look at a looking rotation matrix. It does not create that. It actually creates a, a, a look at direction view matrix. There's a bit, and if you remember correctly, a view matrix is the inverse of your local matrix. So I, I kind of wrote the, in my notes here. This this function is the same as GLML look at. Uh, if you're a C++ person who um, GLML is kind of this really popular uh, like default um, math library, and the la look at look at function actually creates a view matrix that you can just dump directly into your shader. <coughs> In fungi, we don't do that. We actually calculate our local space, then we invert it, and then pass that into the shader. This kind of just rolls those two things in all into one. So you pass in the camera position. I forget what the, the parameter is, but that's where we have to calculate the look at, but it, it inverts it for you automatically. It creates a view matrix out of it. <coughs> oh my God. Um, too much talking. So it creates a view, a view matrix 
for the light camera. So this way you don't have to we don't have to do the invert or anything else. So it's all pre-done and ready to go. So now that we have the view matrix, we can then transform our Fustrum that exists in world space right now. We have those coordinates. Um, we we translate it and we move it into that camera space. And um, once we have that translated into that camera space, we want to calculate the minimum and maximum bounding. So we want to make a bounding box for our Fustrum in that space. Uh, and if you want to see what the Fustrum looks like in that space, it's the black one. It's the So essentially, from this camera, this Fustrum in world space looks like this. Now, the only reason why we're doing this is because we need to know the actual size, the bounding area for the Fustrum, but inside the camera space. That's the whole, the whole reason why we're doing this. We need that bounding area because that bounding area is basically the size of our auto orthographic because you got um, an orthographic projection creates a box and a perspective a, um, projection creates a fustrum. It creates two different shapes. So we want to basically move this into that camera space so we can actually see how, how, how big of a box do I need to fit that entire thing in? And that's why we're doing this. We, we're trying to fit that in a box. So if I get rid of that. So once we have the, the, the bounding box, we can then calculate like these half values from it. So it's kind of like the half value. So from the center point out to center point in, Yeah, so uh, do I have a thing that calculates the orthographic points? No. Do I? Yeah, I'm going to do that right now. Um, so to, to understand what we're... I just want to make sure you guys understand what I'm doing there. Um, so the idea is that once I have the bounding, like the overall, because the, the bounding box exists in this odd shape in world space. So ideally, you know, if I have, it's not like, it's not perfectly dead center, it's like offset. So we need to calculate its size and then um, cut it in half, essentially. So this way we can, so the camera can be here, because this is the point of the camera. So this way we can then know how far to go this way, how far to go this way. How far to go this way? It's so basically to define the actual box. So that's why we kind of need to do the half seas because we because the bounding box is basically just here, in here, in camera space, <coughs> in light camera space or in light space if you want to call it. Some people call it just light space, but we need to translate that all into something that's usable in world space, I guess, or just in general, like from like negative one to one type of idea. I'm sorry, man. I have, I'm just really dehydrated. Um, all right. So, so that's kind of what this is all about. So once we have those values, we can then use those half values to calculate the width and height of the box. And, um, we set up the the we we just save our light camera. We, we have we calculate our light camera position here, right here, and um, yep, and we do the rotation, and this look rotation is what we so this the idea is this is almost the same thing as this minus the inverting. So I, I have a quaternion. I do the look at function, and I just do it the way that we normally we use it. And then I would set the orthographic projection, which is the half values, negative, positive, because we define those those um, four directions from the center of the camera. <coughs> and 
And to make life easier to understand, I visualized the orthographic camera. And there you go. So that's pretty much the proximity. Like um, the half values um, gives you a better shadow. There's a way, th there's a, I, I, I got rid of it, but in the code you'll find in GitHub, there's another set projection function. I don't want to confuse you guys too much with code, but um, there's, there's different value. You can set the orthographic projection where it actually fills in this area, but it, it fills in too much and you get worse shadows, but doing the half Cs, um, does a better job of it. I think this is, I'm I think I'm projecting this wrong because the camera is here. So I probably uh, the cam so this needs to be sho shoved um, shoved over more. Um, I don't know why. There's like a there's a kind of a yeah because yeah, this this bounding box should be shifted over more. Oh, you know what? Oh, that's why. Okay, because I need to update the view matrix. I think that might fix it. Will that fix it? No, it doesn't fix it. I just draw. So, <coughs> ideally, this should be the camera. This should be shifted over more and centered. But yeah, for some reason, the code and uh, the visualization is not working very well. But like I said. This square, sh this, uh, the first room should be pretty much mostly inside the author projection matrix. So, like I said, the orange is our orthographic light space, and the gray is our main camera of first room. So, those are, those are the, our two viewing cameras visualized, uh, just not perfect. Like I said, this box should be more over there. Uh, can, I, can I fix why it's broken? I need to set this. Yeah, it's is it. It just visualizes it. Yeah, it's whatever. I don't. I don't feel like fixing it. I need to set it as an offset or something. But or there's some missing data. But overall, this is pretty much the exact same shape. Uh, and that's pretty much it for that. Uh, and then you can just keep rendering it. And then during for every loop, you, you calculate the, the, all the frustrums, and then you render the scene, and then you render the scene again with the actual everything else. Um, let me actually switch over to this one. Because this one has all the visualizations turned on, and it can get really bad with rendering. The hell? Yeah, sometimes it thinks it doesn't refresh very well. Okay. Nah, well, okay. It's a different. This is the hell. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand why that's happening. Uh, the directional light set shadow camera is the exact same code we looked at in here. Uh, the only difference is I don't have any of the visualization code in here. That's why I'm kind of switch over, trying to switch over. Or here's the other code. Uh, I guess I left it in this one. This one's like the the bigger size box version of it, and this is a half size. So you can actually try experimenting with either one of them. Um, you, you might like you'll probably get more shadows out of this one, but the quality will be worse. This one you get less shadows, but the quality will be improved. Um, so yeah, there's like two different versions of it. Um, you can go by like stack says shadows is kind of tricky especially if you're doing it this way but it's easier to learn it this way first then do it because this this kind of shows you the i the, the overall ideas of dealing with the fuss drum and then calculating the orthographic projection and everything else and and i'm trying to visualize it so just so you can kind of picture everything in your head so you can kind of know how to mathematically do it um so that's like so i don't understand why this oh because i'm using this function that's why comment that out and then I'm not using that visualization code anymore oh oh 
Yeah, when I move the camera too far away, things can happen. It's like because remember that the length is ten. So if I'm the camera is too is far away, I don't get the shadow. It's no longer within that viewing space. So that's why I said that that viewing space is kind of small. But within well, as long as I'm within that viewing space, everything's is hunky dory. Uh, I'm like right at the the cuff end of the viewing space. That's why you're getting these weird kind of artifacts. So I'm like I've, I've right the very end of it. So like I said, it's not the best shadow. Like if if you're if you're gonna just do like one character and you're just gonna do like a ro rotation type of thing, it's just a, a, like more of a still. Sh more still frame-ish type of things. This is probably this will work really well. I think when it comes to games and everything else, probably not the best. Cause like I said, now that the camera, like I only have a range of ten. Um, if I were to, let's see which function am I using? I'm using this one. Set shadow camera. Do I set that anywhere? Uh, if I set it to 20, I can probably go f a further distance away. So, so at this point, the shadow should be acting up like crazy, but it's not because my range is now set to 20 instead of 10. But like at at 20, this is not so bad. Like a little finicky, but now that I'm now that I'm not past the 20 point, that's when things get wrong. So. Yeah, so like I said, this is not the best algorithm, but it's the easiest one to learn because after this, it just gets more complicated. Because um, the idea that like cascading is you, t you actually take the f entire frustrum and then you end up calculating smaller versions of I think the orthographic projection, and then you do them as layers. And I think you have to end up rendering the s the scene more than uh, the shadow map. Then you might have to sh render like three or four different shadow maps, and at, at different lengths. So the closer you are, um, the better the quality. The further you are, the less the quality, and, and so on and so forth. So like I said, this is just a single orthographic projection on top of a smaller fustrum where the cascading one, you can take the entire fustrum and then layer the orthographic projection. But like I said, this this will then uh, segue you into the cascading shadow uh, mapping algorithm. Um, like I said, you need to learn how to Kind of how to how to handle with the how to handle calculating the frustrums and the uh and the view space for the orthographic projection. All right, so that's really all the lo logistics really of shadow maps, right? Um, I don't know if there's I got the 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 math for calculating the frustrum from this website. There's the math and how to calculate the points. It's a lot of math. Uh, so you go to GitHub, you know, like I said, and bear off of doing it that way. Um, bounding boxes. This might actually might be the best get orthographic points function because I think I might have rewrote this in another version. That's probably why the, the, this one doesn't work as well. Um, and I also have a Microsoft... Uh, Example that I kind of try to pour it over, and it's 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 similar, but it's it it does things slightly differently here. There, but it's overall the exact same idea. So the the idea is always kind of the same, but it's done differently here and there. Um, I think this one gives me not as good as a result as the one I have now. The one I have now, I found from I I, should, I probably have the link in, uh, in the description, but. <coughs> All right, so let's let's get this over with because I'm spending too much time. Um, now the last thing that we need to deal with is the actual shader. So if I go to Fung Lighting Shadow, uh, everything kind of the same is the same. The only thing I'm probably adding is the light projection matrix and the shadow texture. Uh, material stays the same. Vertex stays the same. It's very simple. Um, since the last version, I try to simplify the function a little bit, so it's more simplified. Um, before I used to have all the fong lighting 
dumped into the main function. Now I kind of made a, fun uh, a function called fung lighting. This so all the math is here. I, I tweaked it, I guess, if I need it. So it works as a function. Uh, so this way I can actually kind of maybe make this as a snippet and have that carry over from shader to shader without duplicating it. Um, is lighting possible? That also is, is here. Um, I guess simplified it. You know, it, it just it checks. Uh, it just basically checks to see if there's a normal or if there's an emission. If it is, it then no, don't do lighting on this pixel specifically. Uh, in the previous video, we have it. I like to say I just turned it into a function to make it life easier. Um, and the big change is calculate the shadows. So. So we get the world position, and then we kind of pass it in to our check and shadow function. So if we go into check our check shadow function, here's the part that says we need to convert our world position into light space. So we multiply by our light projection matrix. Then we map it from negative, I think this is NDC, into UV coordinates. So we're just remapping it. Um, I've got this. This is uh, we have to divide by W, essentially. And then that once we have the UV coordinates, we can then use that UV coordinates to get the shadow texture. It's in our channel. And then we can ignore this for now. This is something extra. And then from there, we check to see if the. I probably should fix this where once I calculate this value, I should also check to see if it's not less than one. If it's not less than one, I should just say false because you're, you're not inside that light space. Because um, if you're past one, then you're past the, the depth buffer. So, and that, can give, that gives you some weird artifacts. Um, let's see if I do... Can I give? It, can I see where the artifacts apply? Uh, there might be other things. Oh, you know what? There might be other things going on. Um, but it helps. There, there like there's there's some weird artifacts where the background gets this dark shading that can screw things up. And if we make sure that that depth um, light space is less than one. Like all, it's all all its values is less than one. We're good to go. Um, if it's outside of it, then we have problems. It, it, like it'll just start sh adding shadows where they don't belong. Um, but I guess I don't have enough big enough world to show you the the, the artifacts. I know. <clears throat> now what I want to do want to show you one thing though. Um, the whole bias and theta thing. If I don't add that bias value, this is what happens. This is what shadow looks like by default. Um, it's they, they call this shadow acne, and that's because you're ac you're trying to access the uh, it's 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 kind of wonky you do because that translation from one camera to the other gives you some weird um, issues. Like things aren't perfectly even. There's kind of like this weird unevenness about it. Um, and I think uh, float averaging might, uh, float, uh, ah, what's it called? Float error, uh, float rounding errors kind of help cause this problem. So if you want to kind of get rid of shadow acne, you kind of create something called a bias. And a bias is just basically how much do you want to push something? So this way it's Either in the shadow or it's not in the shadow. It just it just kind of just nudging the d the depth just by a by a small amount. And um, you can kind of start off. I think probably one works can kind of work. You can see by just th by just nudging it, I, I you instantly fix fix it. Um, but if you want to make it a little bit much smarter, 
there's a, there's an um, equation to actually calculate the bias so it can kind of change based on the direction of the light or by the by the angle of the light. So by the normal value of the pixel based on the light direction, you get the angle and use that in this math equation, which kind of creates a more smarter version of the bias. So it's a smarter bias version. Granted, I'm not a mathematician. I don't know how this part works, but it does so. So it creates basically between a range of 0 to 1. And there you go. Not much has changed. So that's bias to help get rid of acne. Um, there's also one last optimization that you can kind of do, but I don't have them on because currently uh, the way the code is working now, I, it doesn't cause a problem. Um, something that's called Peter Panning. And the way I wrote this and I have to have the scene, it doesn't create Peter Panning at all. So I don't know <coughs> why. Uh, but Peter Panning is when the shadow looks like it's detached from the 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 the, s the object that that's creating the shadow. It's like it's not attached to it. That's called Peter Panning, because uh, it's because it's kind of a joke because of the movie Peter Pan. His shadow was able to detach from Peter Pan himself, and the shadow can do its own thing. So the shadow looks like it's detached from the object that that's ca casting the shadow. That's called Peter Panning, and some hacks that you can do to fix that issue is to render more things. Now, they, they, they normally say, I, I, I wasn't experiencing Peter Panning before, but once I optimized, and, and actually I think it was, I was suffering Peter Panning with the Microsoft version of um, how they did shadow mapping. <coughs> but I think in the NIST version, I don't get Peter Panning, so that's why I don't have it turned on. Um. So if you get Peter Panning, instead of drawing the, f um, calling the front faces, because you, when you're uh, back face, <coughs> let me drink some more water. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I dripped water on my tablet. Um, where was I? <laughs> uh, okay. So when we're rendering a scene, you, uh, we're always calling the back faces because the back faces can't be seen. Like the other side of like, this side is is shouldn't be it is doesn't render because there's no point in rendering that side. So the other side of this um, cone isn't being rendered at all. Uh, it's just rendering the front faces. When you do your shadow maps, you can switch calling to front instead of back. By default, it's set on back, but you can set it to front. And don't forget to set it back to back when you're done, and that should fix Peter Panning. I'm curious if this would actually cause Peter Panning for me now if I were to do this. So yeah, there you go. So by actually doing it, I actually create Peter Panning. So this is Peter Panning. That, that, that fix is supposed to fix the problem. Uh, actually causes the problem. And like I said, this... Um, and I noticed that some, like if I was having Peter Panning problems and sometimes calling the front or doesn't work, uh, I would actually just render all uh, all the faces. It doesn't matter if it's back or front. And uh, this one should give you the non-Peter Panning thing. Uh, so this way I'm rendering all faces. It doesn't matter if it's the back or front. Uh, but like I said, I, I leave it in there so you guys can, like, if you experience Peter Panning, these are, like, this is, like, the, the worst option you should do. You don't want to render every single verse, every single face if you don't have to. But if for some reason you can't fix Peter Panning, thank you, Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Like, I think this kind of worked, but certain depending on the, the distance from the camera, things will get worse with the Microsoft version. Then this was like the the worst option, but it fixed it. It's fixed it. So that's two solutions basic to fix Peter Panning. But using the new algorithm that I found, I don't need to do either one, and it does a pretty good oops, pretty good job of um, Peter Panning. And there's your shadow maps. And wow, this is a long video, so I'm just gonna quickly sh demo some 
quick stuff that you might enjoy. Um, I have the Fuckstrom. And see, this one actually creates the square better. I, like I said, I did a better job of it in a different file. Um, so this is what our projection matrix looks like. All right? And, uh, and I added animations into it. So you can see how things look like when the camera starts moving around. Uh, where, are, where is it? Let's unrender. So let's say if I do this, rotating the camera between 45 and... So there you go. So you can kind of see that the orthographic camera keeps flexing itself to try to keep the Fuckstrom within view. And like I say, that, that orange is where the camera is. And it's kind of pointing because that's the really the front face, but I don't want to go into that right now since the video has been almost like an hour long, uh, over an hour long at this point. Um, so there you go. So there's I, I made other animations. You can comment in and out. So you can kind of visually see what's actually going on. So this the camera is actually just uh, just rotating in place. And you kind of see that the, the orthographic projection always stays where it is because that's where the sunlight is. So we're kind of creating that visual feel. Um, now what is this? Back and forth? That's no fun. Uh, let's do this one. This one's fun. Um, refresh. Uh, and this is uh, the camera actually doing it. This is an orbit camera. Uh, I'm, I'm, or I'm rotating the camera as an orbit. And, like, and, and here's the, the light camera. And like I said, when you're rendering it per scene, you kind of uh, you just try to flex it. You try to try to squeeze all that into the space. So this is so when I'm moving around and things like that in the previous file, this is what's actually visually happening. Like, and, and like I said, <laughs> I did a better job um, visualizing the orthographic projection camera. So there you go. It's, I I feel vindicated now. I know I did a better job of that. <coughs> and red and and green denotes far and, and near plane. So red is the far plane and green is the near plane. Uh, and the last thing I demoed just for fun, before I finish off, I made a sundial. And there you go. And oh, that's because I'm too far away. All right. And there you go. So the light is moving, and I'm recalculating, and I'm applying shadows, and there's a sundial. It works how it's kind of supposed to work. It's not perfect. There's a little bit of Peter Panning going on in this one. So it's slightly detached. Like I said, this is not the best shadow algorithm, but it's the one you should really go through to understand how all this works. Okay? Um, and there, you know, I'm too far away now. <laughs> now the lighting doesn't work. Um, so let me just, let's not end the video like that. That's sad. All right. <coughs> um, so there you go. That is shadow mapping with directional lighting. It's not the best way of doing it, the best way of learning it. I don't know how many times I have to say it because I feel bad teaching you not the best quality of it. But like I said, I'm trying to teach you guys. Like, If you look at it code and then you study it and then you kind of do all the, that visualization of how to do the Fuckstrom and the orthographic projection, you'll end up growing a much bigger understanding of how cameras work and how the matrices work and how, how everything really looks like in the real world. Like, I love that visualization thing, that uh, the, the Fuckstrom file. This is great because this really shows you what which was that's what's really going on, you know. <coughs> I, th basically, this is my fake main camera, and th and this and my real ma my real real camera is the one actually seeing things from afar. Um. So it like like the, this really shows you and really <coughs> like I said the um, the cascading one actually builds these orthographic cameras if I remember correctly inside the Fushroom. It actually creates them inside. But you have to create, I think, more than one. So, and then, so you have multiple cameras, multiple renderings. Like I said, that becomes more complicated. Uh, this one is a simple algorithm, and you're only dealing with two cameras instead of multiple cameras.
But once you understand how to do handle two cameras together, adding a bunch of extra cameras and then just putting them in proper places with the correct orthographic projection should be easier. <laughs> right? Once you figure this crap out, the other stuff should be a lot easier. Um, so I'm sorry this is a really long video, but this topic is very hard. To There's a lot that goes around to, to making this work correctly. Shadows is just not easy. Um, okay, and I have an appointment soon. I need to leave. So um, there you go. That's it. Um, shadow mapping with Light to Shrek. Uh, so I'm sorry for the long video. I hope you got to learn. Please go check out the GitHub. There's tons and tons of code related to this I put there. Uh, I have like tons of links, I think. Oh, yeah, I have like a bunch of links and videos. If you want to learn more about shadow mapping, there's tons of stuff. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot. Um, I think the Microsoft one's probably cool, really cool because it has a lot of it. It has like different ways of doing it. I think it even has your cascading uh, ones. So, uh, yeah, that that's probably one of the best ones you probably should check out. Um, even though I don't like Microsoft and their code actually didn't work very well for me. It's worth a read and at least it gives you the idea of what to look for if you want to continue your search on studying how to create shadows in, how to simulate shadows in a 3D environment. So please like and subscribe. It helps my channel out. Um, thank you for my, my, all my Patreons. If you feel like donating a buck, please feel free to check out my Patreon. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll see you guys in the next video, which I'm going to do something fun. Um, see you guys.